So I had a live stream the other night about someone giving me their coin collection to sort through. So now I brought it to my LCS guy. All right, everyone. Silver Steeler here. And winning image photography. And, and we're here with <laughs> and Kurt. Kurt Plowman. <laughs> and uh, he's going to go ahead and give us a quick little what this might be worth. We've talked a little bit about it, so dig in. I know you're the uh, penny guy, or do you like cents better, or do you like them both? Uh, I, 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 li I like cents. You know, a lot of people call them pennies. Um, the, the reality is, is that no matter what you call them, copper U.S. coinage or clad copper U.S. coinage is obviously probably my second favorite coinage to collect. I started with I started with cents and pennies, uh, the 1909 SVDB roll hunting and digging through uh, buckets of them with my grandfather. So that's kind of like the, the seed that started my uh, weed patch of collecting. <laughs> All right. But uh, Morgan Dollars, of course, as I said, are my favorite absolute coin. Just love the artistry and the history behind it. So, But yeah, um, wheat scents uh, are definitely one of my favorites to look at. Um, you know, they're one of those coins where they don't have to be... Um, really, uh, they don't have to be really, really, really expensive to collect a truly beautiful specimen of a coin. Um, you know, there's lots of, lots of uh, copies of most coins available in pretty much every variety. You could put a set together in any condition you wanted to. If you wanted to do, a, you know, a complete MS set, you're not going to spend $8 billion doing it. Um, and then even if you get into all the VAMs and all the different possible varietals that are out there, you can still put together a set, you know, really reasonably. And it's pretty cool if you think about the fact that, you know, uh, even something as, as uh, high dollar as a 1909 SVDB is only going to be a couple thousand dollars on the top end if it's graded and certified. And so it's a very attainable collection to put together. And then for the novice roll hunter, finding wheat cents is always fun because, you know, you've already doubled your money. I mean, right. just, just, you know, you go to the bank and you get a roll of pennies and you go through and you find them. You find a wheat cent, you've at least doubled your money. Right. There's not a dealer that I know of in the country that doesn't at least pay two you know, at least pay two cents a piece on them, even if they're culls worn down and, and scraggy looking, you know. You get into coins that are, have much better condition, much better luster, especially the older ones in the teens and 20s, and you've got decent value there, comparative to their original issue price or their face value. Um, if you look at a Morgan dollar, a standard circulation Morgan dollar, standard circulation piece dollar in average circulated condition, you're looking at $16, $17 most commonly when you walk in the door at an LCS. That's 16 times face. But if you look at a penny, a wheat cent like this one, which has a tremendous amount of blemish on it, obviously that, that it, no collector wants to make that a star of their collection. It's got, a dam it's got damage on one side, still a good example on the other side. I'd still give you twice or 200 times its face value. Uh. Okay, so that's a pretty good return, and it's a fairly low investment because if you were roll hunting or if you were buying bags of wheat scents from, you know, one of the uh, uh, security companies that carries them around like Loomis or Brinks, you know, they're selling them to you at a penny in most cases. Mm -hmm. um, now, some of the newer locations, they're sorting them now, but uh, and they're doing them by weight. The machines can weigh the difference between a copper scent and a non-copper scent. But uh, a lot of fun things about these guys is that you still, again, it's a guaranteed return on every one of them you find. And right. then when you find a 1909, you know, you get a few dollars to 15 18 dollars in ungraded. You get 1909 S's and 1909 VDB's, and you're still looking, again, great money. You can get a 1909 S VDB or a 14D or a 31S in there, and you're looking at a coin that's, you know, 31 times, uh, or 30, I'm sorry, 30, you know, 31, 32 bucks for a coin that cost a penny. Right. That you found in, in a roll for a penny, if you're lucky. Now, if you're not lucky, even if you go to an auction, you'll find boxes of coins at local auctions all the time that have a handful of wheat cents in there. Right. You know, um, you, you, it, it's quite regular to find semi-key dates in there. You know, mm -hmm. and I find lots and lots and lots of teens. As you know, we've always got buckets around. You if do. you've been here yesterday, we had, you know, about 4,000 of them in a bucket over here. A gentleman came in and, and bought all of them, and we hadn't even had time to go through them yet. Literally, they came in, I think they came in on Thursday, and they went out the door on Friday or Saturday. I can't remember which day he came in, and he wow. got them all that quick. So it, right. it, we, we go through them so fast, we don't get time to necessarily look through every cent we'd like to. You know, ones that are already two by two when they come in, obviously somebody took the time, so there must be a reason why. Sometimes, not like this one, we can regularly tell that this one probably came from uh, your friends over there at uh, at uh, Arizona Coin Company. This is quite common for the way they put them together. Um, they ship them out that way. Uh, they have a little uh, rubber stamp that they stamp on there, things like the word rare or key or semi-key. 
we're looking at a coin that's you know got lots of damage and yes it is a lower mintage the 1863 but that poor coin has been bent it's got surface damage it's been polished not just clean somebody's actually buffed this oh puppy. so with the condition of that coin it you know obviously it's it, it, it's going to be a very low cost low value specimen of an 1863 um, you know, so, but when you see these kinds of collections, it's easy to go through and pick out what's there and how much money you've got or how much value you've got, because a lot of the stuff is they've done half the work for you, you know, um, yeah. Did you, did, I mean, I, I, I thought at first when I saw it from afar that that was going to be worth something, and then, you know, unfortunately yeah. it's, it's been bent, it's been, mm -hmm. what else, what else? took an ice what, pick to it. Yeah, what else is the problem with that coin? So, uh, problem number one, the very first thing that should be very glaring to anybody is that this coin, again, has been what I call polished. It's This thing's been uh, <laughs> surface enhanced. <laughs> right. Uh, someone's given this puppy some love to bring out the, the, the details in the coin and make it nice and bright and shiny. A new collector or a novice probably thought, oh, I'm going to make that look so good. Um, obviously, nothing's going to fix it. This puppy has been through the mill. It's been stamped and cramped and munched and crunched and rolled in every way you can think of it's the, the coin is almost waffly uh, in its uh in, in its uh texture we can actually you can see it's not flat by any stretch of the imagination uh we've got all kinds of surface damage where it looks it looks to me to be machine caught like it got caught in some kind of machine because there's a repetitive striking going on there Both i think sides. that's yeah and i know you were saying it looked kind of like an ice pick to me that looks more like a machine has caught on it uh, I don't know what what kind of machine it would have been in, but yeah. And then that kind of softness or smoothness is almost and in, always indicative of someone polishing that with, uh, like maybe a Dremel tool or a slow speed buffer. Mm -hmm. um, but that buffing is is definitely where it's been polished out. Um, so this, is there anything left of value in that coin, or practically? Well, I mean. Okay, so it's it's an example of numismatica. You know, mm -hmm. you could obviously use it as a hole filler in a book if you happen to be putting together a book and you need it in 1853, and until you find a better specimen, it's always worth it. Right. It's still a couple bucks. I mean, it's, you know, still right. two bucks is about what it would be worth. Um, right. we would, we'd put it in the shop for sale for like two fifty. dollars right. um, The catch to that is, is that because of the condition it's in, it's never going to be gradable. It's never going to be anything high dollar. I mean, even right. 100 years from now, this coin is still going to be what it is. You can't change the fact that the coin's heavily damaged. And I, I, anybody who watches this video, I beg you and implore you that if you are a collector or you want to be a collector, the first thing you should remember is don't polish anything ever no matter what you'll never make the coin better if you want coins that are shiny and beautiful then you have two choices item number one buy brand new from the mint put them immediately into a quality protector say a dansko album or have them encapsulated by one of the big three grading companies or if you're looking for older coins, which you obviously can't go to the Mint today and get an 1853 large cent. What you can, however, do is save your money up and buy a specimen that is naturally this beautiful. Okay? And I say beautiful because when I say beautiful, I'm talking about lustrous. I don't actually consider this coin to be beautiful. To me, this coin is uglier and less desirable than a holy moly, one that's been drilled or been to church. Uh, I would rather have this coin in my collection. A... This coin has genuinely been loved. Someone's carried it in their pocket for a very long time. It's been used over and over and over again, and it's a prime example of what United States currency should be, which is valued prize kept and used. You know, this was this was a, a utilitarian piece. Coins, you know, uh, you look at one of these guys, and of course I'm gonna I'm gonna scare you all now, but you look at this one. This coin obviously has a lot of the surface detail is gone, absolutely worn down from time. You know still way in way better shape than this one this coin in this condition far more valuable than this coin okay now let's pretend for a minute this coin had not been um, smashed and mangled by a machine if they had taken a coin with that much detail where you could still clearly see you know the inside reading you can see the stars you know you got a nice strong date um, you've got parts of the curly cues left in the hair if, if that stuff was still there and the surface damage wasn't there and the coin hadn't been uh, been bent and mangled and they polished it, they would have taken a coin that was worth easily a hundred dollars and made it worth five bucks. So don't polish your coins. No matter what you do, don't polish them. And unless you are a highly experienced, highly trained, paid professional in coin conservation, there is absolutely nothing you can do to a coin to enhance its value 
that is safe. Mm -hmm. I know coin collectors that have been collecting coins for 25 and 30 years that have the skills to make a coin have more eye appeal, and it still won't pass muster when you send it in to get it graded. Okay? Remember, grading comes with magnification. They use microscopes, magnifying glasses, multiple people looking at your coin. It's not just one guy who looks at mm -hmm. the coin. The coins are looked at by multiple people. And then, to top all of that off, just because it looks eye clean doesn't mean the coin is actually clean. All right? So, when a true collector goes looking for a specimen and they're looking for a high dollar, high quality specimen, they're going to want it certified, which means you're not going to pull the wool over their eyes anyway. The only person you're going to possibly make want to buy that coin is either a novice, in which case shame on you for trying to, you know, take advantage of a novice. Uh, and the other thing you're going to possibly do is destroy what value might be there. And you don't ever want to do that. You want to always, you know, keep your coins in as close to original condition as possible. If you have to do something, you know, uh, if you if you get a coin that somebody's dug out of the ground and, you know, you, you find a... An, a Carson City Morgan dollar, or you find a, you know, a, a Fuego chain scent, or something like that, that is worth preserving and cleaning. Take it to a professional. Put it into a baggie, you know. Take it to a professional and have them conserve the coin for you. And worse comes worse, if you can't do that and you absolutely feel like you must do something to the coin, get some uh, distilled water. Place the coin in some distilled water. Let it sit for a moment, okay, and then rinse it off. Don't scrub the coin, don't polish the coin, don't buff the coin, don't use toothbrushes and Dremel tools and, you know, that kind of stuff. I know some guys will say it's okay to use a sonic cleaner. There are some guys who say it's okay to use a cotton swab and gently, you know, brush the coin. But all of that stuff runs the risk of damaging the surface further. Make sure you have a coin that is not high dollar before you do any of that stuff. So bring it to an expert, let them look at it, let them say, hey... This coin is worth investing some time and money in and set it up and have it conserved. Send it in and pay for coin conservancy. Or if you have a professional you work with, if you have a local coin shop uh, that has a, a highly trained professional and they're really comfortable taking care of your coins, you know, you can trust them to do that. And, and I encourage people, you know, protect and conserve your, your currency. That's never, ever a bad thing, but do it the right way. Mm -hmm. You know, and Dawn dish soap and, and Brillo pads is never a solution to making a coin look better. At the end of the day, you get a coin that is polished and shiny and you throw it in an auction, you run, might run the risk of somebody buying this coin thinking they're getting a beautiful coin, and then when they get their heart broken by taking it to a coin guy, and they find out that it's not, they'll stop going to the auctions, they'll stop buying the coins, so now if you're trying to sell them for a profit, you've lost yourself a possibly good buyer, and the other thing you've done is you've destroyed something. You can never take that back. You can't ever undo that damage, mm -hmm. so you know, be very careful with that. So, um, as far as the, the coins are concerned, you know, you've got a nice representation here. Um, you've got, obviously, some nice... Uh, uh, I wouldn't have listed some of these as, as uncirculated. Uh, some of them have had some surface treatments. Um, you know, for example, these guys have got natural toning occurring. These guys have not. That is artificially clean. It's artificially beautiful. And again, this is probably from one of those companies out there. Um, and if you're from one of those companies, you know what you're doing there. You're taking a coin and you're doing exactly what I said not to do, which is making it look all shiny and pretty, and then stamping this on there to convince people that it's more valuable. And I'll tell you, this particular configuration, I see these a lot of times at local auctions. There's a couple of companies that send boxes out, um, which we do that as well, but we don't do this to them. Um, they put the coins together, they label them, they take a lot of time and make the coin look cool, make a mini set and send it off this way. And you get a lot of novice collectors that are excited because they're getting coins that are in slightly better condition. Um, coins that look eye, they have eye appeal to them, but they're not tremendous value. They just, they, they've tried to artificially add value through packaging. Right. Much like companies like, uh, you know, uh, Littleton and, and that do, they, they, they make the coin look really great. They give you a great presentation piece. But remember, that doesn't necessarily enhance the value of the coin. It enhances the eye appeal, and it makes the coin more attractive to collect as a novice collector. True collectors are putting together sets and books. And I'm not saying novice collectors aren't true collectors, but they're at the beginning, so they're just starting to learn. Um, the thing to remember is that you need to buy the coin and not the package uh, when you're purchasing things at auction, especially look at the history of the coin. Um, and if you see that the 1965 uh, Memorial Back Scent is, is selling, you know, uh, for four, five, six dollars a piece, you have to ask yourself why, because it's not that valuable. That particular, I think the book value in Red Book is like 40 cents or 45 cents and brilliant uncirculated. So it's not a high dollar coin, uh, no matter what you do to it. Now wait 30 years or 40 years and it starts crescendoing or reaching the top of its 
uh, appeal and you start getting collectors that are reaching the age where that coin was fresh and new when they were five and six years old or ten years old now the coin will start to gain in value just much as much as the uh, you know the 1909 pennies we've got people that are alive today um, that you know are, are buying coins from their birth year so to speak or from when they were you know they remember seeing this coin when they were 10 years old or 15 years old as being a $40 coin a $50 coin and now we're seeing those being $100 and $300 coins so time makes things get more valuable not polishing and buffing so when you are looking at your collection you want to do that shiny does not necessarily mean more valuable um, it's nice to see shiny coins. It's nice to see bright and polished co or bright coins, but make sure they're not polished. You know, clearly this person liked uh, 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 numismatics, so they didn't just buy that stuff. But uh, when we're looking at this collection, I see a, a nice, uh, a nice novice group of coins. Nothing here is. Uh, right. I've not seen anything that that you know rings lots of bells and whistles. There are definitely some nice starter pieces in here. Um, so this is more typical of what you'd find from uh, the uh, coin shops uh, and trade shows and going to uh, swap meets and, and coin clubs. Um, you got 1887, Indian Head Cent there. Um, average condition, uh, Liberty's gone. Um, you know, obviously there's no, no braiding remaining. You can't see any diamonds on there. So uh, the uh, reverse of the coin is the same way. Um, you know, it's just average circulated condition. Uh, they've got it priced at 95 cents. That's actually pretty fair. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if, if you were to come into my store, it'd be easy for you to find this coin for that neighborhood of price, about 95 cents. Mm -hmm. So now this may have been priced, who knows when, how long ago. From the look of the holder, it's been in this holder for a while. So at the time, they priced it a little high. But that's because they were probably planning on having to, you know, haggle or dickle, dick, dicker or make a, a, a group deal. They bought 10 or 15 coins. The guy gave them 10% off. So now it's, you know, now it's an 86-cent coin instead of a 95-cent coin, which is probably right on the money at the time if this was from, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s pricing. So you, you do see this person actually probably did buy some of these coins from there. Um, so let's see here. We, let's see if we can do some math. Everybody ready? So, uh, it, um, winning, if you'll get your calculator out for me real quick since my hands are kind of busy. So we have an 1862 Indian Head Scent. Uh, obviously, this is the heavier composite. And you take a look, and they say that it's uh, 120 years old. So that means that this coin is from, according to my calculator, 1982? 120? So 1862 plus 20, would that be right? Mm -hmm. 1882. So they're, they're 1982. So they bought this coin in 1982 and they said it's a $4 specimen. So, and that's not really far out of whack for that time frame. Um, if you came into my store today, it would probably be priced probably a little bit more than that. Um, of course, that was in 82. This is, you know, 2019. We've got a 20. few more years. Yeah. So 2020 or 2020. Sorry. You're right. We are past the new year now. So yeah, um, it, it, that's a. It, they're, some of these coins are priced reasonably, uh, probably from what they paid for them. Um, I'm not going to say who, but I recognize some of the handwriting on a couple of these. So I'm not sure uh, if they bought them from that person, which is probably very likely uh, a local collector. Well, you've been around a local dealer, so yeah. I, sometimes you can recognize things like so, that. So I mean, uh, on a quick jot, just to your mm -hmm. eye. I mean, you want to just do all the pennies real quick first. And... Sure. Um, so just looking at your your wheat cents a piece, most of these are going to be in the the two and three cent or four cent. Uh, is what I would offer for them, two, three to four cents. Um, you, there's a few in here that I might go as high as 10 cents on. Your, your, memorial, va your memorial backs, unfortunately, they've been uh, surface clean, so, you know, um, they're worth hanging on to. I, I, you know, if somebody really wanted to sell them, I'd give them, you know, two cents just to, because they're already in a holder. It's really right. the cost of the holder then more than the coin. Um, they're not going to grade out. Uh, as far as your Indian head cents, you know, most of these are going to be in the, um, I would pay anywhere from... 65 85 cents on the ones that are heavily damaged and the better quality specimens uh, there are a few of them in here I'd be in the three to five dollar range there's nothing you know uh, gigantic or catastrophic um, you've got a couple of British large cents here um, the British large cents are starting to see a resurgence on those guys um, we don't have a tremendous amount of buyers here in our store so we actually have to ship them out to other buyers and collectors right now um, we typically send out a, a roll or a batch of these. We send them out in a batch of 100 and we sell them for $55. So it's 55 cents per coin is what we're getting for those in large quantities. Um, you can get more money individually selling them, you know, probably average price of about a dollar a piece. Auctions, I've seen them bring, you know, a buck and a half a piece. They're not really high dollar um, yet. 
Again, we're not in Great Britain, so the number of British collectors in here in the Midwest are not necessarily strong. And if you were in a, if you were in a more metropolis area, say, uh, you know, in, maybe if you're closer to the, to the Florida, the Fun Numismatics group, or if you were maybe in Las Vegas or you know New York, where they have a larger group of people who might be more likely to, to commit to buying British coinage, you might be able to see a little bit more premium. But these guys also also aren't, in, aren't really heavily desirable numbers. Let's look at your large cents here. Um, I actually like this uh, this 1838 uh, piece here. Um, I would offer in the neighborhood of around uh, twelve dollars for that one. Would be my offer um, for that coin by itself. I'd offer twelve on that one. Um, you know, these guys would be a couple of bucks a piece. Again, this one to me has more love to it, and I like the piece better. But it, it, value wise, they're, they're still both because of the surface damage and the holy moly. They're a couple bucks. Um, they're not super high dollar. So let's move over. We have a damaged trime, the nickname mm -hmm. for the silver three cent piece. Uh, has that uh, wonderful six-sided star uh, on one side and the uh, stylized beautiful C with the three in the middle um, representing three cents. Uh, pretty cool piece. There are lots of fun. I, I love good quality specimens. Um, again, this one has had the same love. Um, I, I hope that it wasn't the collector that these came from that did this to the coins. No, I don't, I don't it think not. it was. Yeah, no. because he's got he's got much better coins than if you were going to polish. There would be more a candidate right. for polishing. Again, this guy's pretty heavily waffled. You can probably you can see mm -hmm. absolutely not flat in any shape or form. Um, it's it's you know heavily loved. Um, we'd pay about four or five dollars for that coin in that condition. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, it, we we would sell it for you know probably six. Right. It's not you know if it were in better condition, you know more like twelve fifteen bucks, but not this condition. Okay. Um, we move on to our buffalo nickels. Let's take a look at what we got up here. Um, these are all late date, partial date, and common. So we have a late date here with, that has a full date. Um, this one has a partial date, and this one has a partial date, and this one has basically no date. Um, so again, you, you, not a lot of value there. Let's take a look at these guys. It, I would bulk these guys together, um, and we'd be in the neighborhood of um, probably about $1.50, $1.75 for all eight coins. Uh, wouldn't be a lot. There's, there's again, no key dates. Um, you know, the 25 is only actually a partial date. The 37's got some damage to it. The 36, again, uh, even though you've got full date, you got issues. The 35 is, is kind of a partial date. You can clearly see all four digits, but they're very heavily worn. And uh, the reverses have got a lot of condition issues on there. So they're, you know, you got a lot of corroding and pitting. Um, 1907 Barber Dime, we'd be at uh, $1.20. Uh, it's not, uh, in our, in my opinion, it's not uh, high value. I don't know where, uh, I think that's supposed to be number 25 because there's no way this would be a $25 coin, not even you know, well, in its height. Let's so. hope someone didn't pay that much for it. Yeah, I'd, I'd pay 12 times face or I'd pay $1.20 for it. Right. Um, we could expect to sell it for $1.40, $1.50. Um, so we have a seated Liberty Dime. It's got a little bit of wiggle, but not much, so that's pretty good. It's a CC. Um, 1876 CC. You can, and if we can get a good image there of the CC, and get a little closer there. Is that going to focus? There we go. Yep. Okay. I'm not wearing my gloves, guys. Forgive me. Um, see, the Liberty's got some surface conditions, uh, you know, but not terrible. You can still see most of the details in the draping, and you can see her bust clearly. Uh, the flag's got some heavy wear, but, uh, you know, everybody loves Carson City. Um, oh, I do. Yeah. I so, intend on buying that coin. Yeah. Yeah. How much are you hoping to, to, to lay out on it? <laughs> I, I told him it'd be anywhere from like twelve to fifteen dollars. You're right on the money. Um, we we would I would probably pay uh, I'd probably pay twelve fifty thirteen dollars for okay. it. Yeah. yeah, maybe if I felt bad for the guy when he walked in the door, or if there was something else <laughs> I wanted that I thought I could get some extra value out of, I could go fifteen on that one and recoup the value by on something else. So I don't see any problem with that. Yeah, um, that's what I was going to offer him. Yeah, it's CC. So you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's again. It, it, it's not a low minting. Um, no, it's not. We looked that up too. Yeah, a lot of people think that just the CC is enough. It's not like Morgan dollars. You know, Morgan dollars had the CCs where a lot of them were destroyed. Even though they were low minted, they were a lot of them that were destroyed. Right. Whereas a lot of these made, made it. Yeah. Yeah. They they're made still it through. Available. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we've got a uh, 1920s uh, Walker Walking Liberty half dollar, nicknamed the Walker. Um, I haven't looked at the uh, reverse of this coin yet, but I'm guessing it's a similar condition. Yeah. So heavily circulated. Uh, Again, we have the classic Roman Roman numbering system, or in this case, it might be alphanumeric exchange. So, whichever dealer, if you see this a lot, it's a good education for new collectors. 
You'll see alphanumeric codes are very common for collectors. We've got one locally that uses uh, Roman numerals. We've got another one that uses Roman numerals backwards. We have another one that uses Roman numerals with decimal points. Um, there's another guy that uh, has an alphanumeric exchange where if you look on the back of his, his exchange is, um, I believe it's the coin GU or whatever that, you know, 11 number exchange is. But it, it starts with T-H-E-C-O-I-N, -E -E you know, and his numbers indicate how much he paid for the coin. Right. So he can flip it over and look. Mm -hmm. um, there's one guy I used to use one called, it was I think white bread. Uh, was what his his alphanumeric exchange was. So if you flipped over the coin and said W H I T E, it would have been one two three four five. So you know, literally the number is one two three four five for white. Uh, let's say it had uh, uh, let's say uh, it had uh, H I. So he would have paid twenty one dollars for that coin, right? Or twenty? I'm sorry, twenty three dollars for that coin. So if you learn if you learn your local coin dealer's alphanumeric exchange, you might be able to cheat. Uh, and I say cheat, not really cheat. It's just it's a way to remember how much you paid for the coin over time. Um, everybody has their own way of doing it. Now, we buy most of our stuff using a combination of current silver value, so that's why it fluctuates all the time, and you won't find um, numbers on our, our items. Don't We don't do that. Um, I'll pull something out of the case here for you. So here's a coin right out of our case, um, 1980S. You know, we would just literally grab the book, take a look at this coin, and, and then price it accordingly. Uh, my guess is this is probably going to be like a dollar five, dollar ten. You know, it's not a high dollar coin uh, without grabbing the book and taking a look at it. Um, so, and I just happened to grab something because we were on this particular case. But as a, a good coin dealer should base things based on the market value, not based on what they pay for the coin. If they're basing it on what they paid for the coin, that's more what a collector does than a dealer. So kind of a lesson for you also, at least in my opinion. Market makes a big difference. Um, if you have a coin that everybody wants, no matter how rare it is, if everybody wants it, it's going to be more valuable um, than the book says it is. And, you know, you have to remember, we talked about this a little bit before, that red, red book value should be used for replacement or full retail expectancy. Uh, if you walk in the door at your local coin shop and things are priced at or above red book, be a little concerned or realize that that's their haggle room. Um, the other thing to that is that if you go to a trade show and a coin dealer doesn't have any prices out there, ask him. How do you price your coins? You know, and that'll help you determine what they're doing also. And how someone purchases a coin will help determine how they sell their coin. If they if they're a buyer based on numismatic value versus the uh, the silver or bullion value, you run uh, a, a better chance of dealing with someone who knows exactly what they're buying. Anybody and their brother can get out a calculator and say, you know. Uh, Silver today is at uh, $18.04, so this has got uh, $13 and change in silver in it. You know, It's a 90% coin that weighs a little over an ounce. But the reality is, that's just math for silver. That's not the numismatic or the collectible value of the coin. So when we're doing a collection like this and we're buying, we're um, coming up with a number somewhere in between those. The bullion value, for example, you know, the bullion value on this guy Literally, the melt value on this coin today, I think, is $1.26. So um, if you were to remember that the melt value is $1.26 and we're offering 12 times face value, it's right at, a, you know, pretty close to the melt value on this coin. Um, this coin's heavily circulated. There's nothing, there's not much meat on the bone. It actually probably weighs less than an issued version would, and that's why it's only $1.26 or $1.26. Now you trade that off and you get into a guy like this, 1922, common piece dollar. Um, you know, melt value on this is 13 and change approximately today. Remember that number goes up and down every day. So when you're watching this video, that may not be necessarily true. So take a look at your, your bullion markets. So if you were to buy this coin for that value, you're obviously not going to lose any money uh, as long as the silver market is stable. Um, but that doesn't take into account the collectability of the coin and the fact that this coin is from 1922. Right. You know, we're almost 100 years old. Two years. You know, so yeah. almost 100 years old. But I think peace dollars are undervalued. They haven't jumped like Morgans have. Correct. And yeah. I think I think now's a good time to buy something. Maybe. Yeah, we're starting to see a uh, we're starting to see a resurgence actually in the peace dollars uh, collectability and excitement of the peace dollar. Um, you remember me saying at the beginning of this video and almost every video that I ever do that I I love Morgan dollars. And I love the artistry behind Morgan dollars. Mm -hmm. I am not I am not the rarity there. The beauty of the Morgan dollar and the artistry behind the carving of the Morgan dollar reminds most of us that it looks like a real person that we could actually see on the street. 
Uh, it was actually modeled after a young teacher. Um, so the artistry behind that, when they carved the designs and engraved the very first images of this, it was inspired by real life people. The Lady Liberty effigy that is on the peace dollar is more of a uh, caricature, if you will, or, or it a is representation. It's kind of modeled after the guy's wife, Franchitti's it is. Franchitti's wife. It is, but the difference there is, is that most people look at this and the, you don't see a woman walking around with her mouth slightly agape. Yeah. You don't see women walking around with a crown on their head. Mm -hmm. Remember, at the time when the Morgan dollar was being circulated, women actually did wear headpieces that many times had artificial or real flowers in them. Uh, people would also walk around with their hair up in that style. Uh, this style, more flowing and more stylized, is not was not as popular in the 1920s when this coin was issued. Also, this coin ran into a problem with it. It came off of the, the coattails of... Uh, a breakdown in the silver market. You know, there was a there was a die off in the silver market. That was why they stopped printing or minting the Morgan dollars, and they came back to minting them. They minted the 1921 Morgan dollars, which did not re meet with a lot of success because there weren't a lot of the people investing in silver and purchasing the coin for silver value at the time, because obviously the silver market was way much lower than it is today. And then. You had a coin that had a completely different uh, inspiration behind it. You know, the the peace dollar, as this has been nicknamed because of the words peace at the bottom, also was intended to inspire people. We're coming off of the, you know, the, the, the wars. Mm -hmm. um, and it was supposed to inspire people to invest in numismatics and to instill uh, the thought of peace behind our money. Carry this in your pocket and every time you look at it, think peaceable thoughts or... or you know, enjoy the peace time that we're now celebrating in the 1920s. Um, and that short-lived time frame also was right, you know, obviously we, we know about the crash of 1929. Mm -hmm. So there was all kinds of issues going on that were a bad calamity for the peace dollar. It is a beautiful coin still. Don't take that away from it. It's a beautiful coin. It's well manufactured. Uh, there are lots and lots of examples of, of high quality ones. It's still got beautiful artistry. Um, but it is also the, the changes that were there. We went away from the heraldic eagle on the back with its outstretched wings, which was very common amongst collectors for decades and decades. That pattern is seen on all kinds of our currency. Um, if you go throughout the years, you know, um, you see that, that stretched out eagle. And the other thing you see is that uh, this is the first time where they've tried to put a message on a coin. Right. The word peace was instilled on the coin, and some people took that the wrong way. I'm buying peace with my dollar, rather than being inspired to live a peaceable living. So, and there's all kinds of things. You, there, there are lots of different opinions and takes on the peace dollar as to why it was not as successful for collectors. I think a lot of it also simply had to do with economics. During the 1920s, people were um, reinventing our economic structure here in the country. You know, there was a lot of things going on in the political environment where they were trying to create jobs, programs. Uh, you had a lot of people that were back from war that had to re-enter the, um, the workforce. Um, you had people who were, for the first time in history, buying automobiles at a greater cost than their annual salaries. Uh, I mean, outright buying them rather than doing, you know, like a payroll deduction, things like that. You have um, all these industrial changes are going on between um, our country and other countries. And the peace dollar itself was not being used as an investment piece. And I think people were also a little bit heartbroken because um, they couldn't afford to save them. Um, if you know, during that time frame, a lot of people were still struggling for money. There were all kinds of things that were done uh, during the 20s. You know, you had... Uh, the uh, crash with uh, banking crisis, people didn't trust banks, so money wasn't being stored in banks, it was being hoarded in, your back, in the back room. Paper money weighed less, it was easier to hide a piece of paper inside of a Bible or in the back of a picture than it was to hide a piece of silver. Um, silver dollars are heavy to carry around, so if you had a pocket full of five or six dollars, uh, you know, a single five dollar note accomplished the same thing, which was a lot of money back then. You know, a five dollar note comparably is, you know, what, like twenty dollars or twenty-five dollars nowadays? So with that being said, um, I think that all those things were reasons why the peace dollar never took off with the luster that it should have or the, the fervor of collecting that it should have. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want anybody to discount the beauty of this coin. If you look at the history behind the coin, you got Lady Liberty. You know, you have an effigy of, of, uh, of a woman on there who's supposed to inspire liberty in our country. Uh, you have, you know, uh, In God We Trust clearly printed on this currency. Um, you know, you, you dated 1922, 
You've got the peace insignia on the back at the bottom. You've got the e pluribus unum. You know, um, there's all kinds of artistry behind this coin that should be appreciated. And I think as more and more people of newer generations start coming forward, they'll actually find those things. So um, if you um, get a, a, an opportunity to take the, a, an eyeball look at these coins um, and start looking at the beauty behind it, maybe you'll fall in love with the peace dollar also, which will give you an opportunity to realize uh, that this is a great collectible coin. Um, even though it's not as popular as the Morgan dollar, we are starting to see more and more younger collectors picking up this dollar and, and realizing how beautiful it is and that it should be collected and, and saved. Um, another neat thing about the, the short-lived peace dollar is, is that uh, because it was not run for quite as long a period of time, you know, it's a, it's a set you can put together fairly reasonably without wasting too much uh, of your, your hard-earned resources and put together a registry book for a fairly reasonable price. Even the, the 1928 S's are, are still very affordable today and easily findable in circulation, circulatable conditions. So, um, With the peace dollars up here, I think we talked about the values on them. These guys, unfortunately, are all early. Uh, they're all the early dates, the 22s and 23s. So you're right back uh, value-wise. You know, uh, I would pay in the neighborhood of around uh, $15 a piece for these guys, maybe a little bit more if, uh, if I thought I could stretch there. Um, Let's go ahead and take a look at these guys. We have some Ike dollars at the bottom. Um, we have three Ike dollars. They're all clad. Um, I encourage people to hang on to these and collect them rather than let me buy them from them. If I buy them from you, unfortunately, I'm only going to give you like a dollar to a dollar five a piece on them because there really isn't a lot of collectability to these guys. There's no silver value. They are clad coinage. They're intended to carry in your pocket and you can still spend them today. You can regularly go into your local bank and get them out of the trays. Um, we've got some 76 um, bicentennial half dollars. Again, uh, those are clad versions of those. Uh, keep an eye out if you have silver versions that came in the silver sets. Some people did break those sets out and spend them, but these particular ones are not. We've got a silver round here, which has our, our friend on it. Um, and uh, that, that little Morgan dollar there, for some reason, someone has put the number 965 on this Morgan dollar. I'm not sure why they taped that to the front of her. Uh, she's got the beautiful dentals. You can still see details in the in the wheat shafts at the top. It's actually a very nice uh, a nice example there. Uh, we would pay probably the neighborhood of about uh, eighteen dollars to nineteen dollars for this coin in the condition that it's in. Even with that on there, you can take that off. Now you heard me earlier telling you not to do anything to conserve your coin. Now this is an area where you want to conserve it safely. Uh, we have a way we can remove that. Um, the most common and you know, safest way to do it actually is steam. Steam won't hurt the, hurt the metal, but it'll cause the sticker to peel off. It's just hot water, you know, but we use steam rather than running water because the steam grabs a hold of that gunk and pops it right off of there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, you can you can take the, the coin again and, and then put it into a two by two. Um, let's take a look up here at our 64s. I know we kind of went from top to bottom, but we wanted to jump over to the beauty of the, the dollar coin. So we look down here at these 64s. Um, it's a pretty fun holder. I've seen these before. It talks about the... Uh, the uh, Kennedy uh, presidency on there uh, and his life from 1917 to 1963. It's um, a memorial. Uh, it is the silver version in there. Uh, I'm not sure what this number is down here at the bottom seven. It looks like maybe 790 or 770, so it's probably something someone's written on there. We have a couple of circulated 1964 um, regular Kennedys. Um, you know, they're Right now, we are paying um, right around uh, between nine and ten times face value, depending on what the silver market is. That gives us a little bit of room on the bone if we get them that are in that are heavily worn. These guys are not heavily worn, so you'd probably be okay actually giving if you wanted to go full full melt value on those guys. You wouldn't have any problem right there. We look at the '67 and '68s. These are, of course, the the uh, lovely 40 percenters. So they still have the solid side. Um, but the 67 and 68ers are not 90%, so you have to adjust for that. Again, not quite old enough again, and these guys are circulated conditions, so they're not uh, highly prized for numismatics yet. Um, if you don't need to sell them and you can afford to sell them, you should, because again, the, when they get old enough, they will start gaining numismatic value. Right now, with the silver value where we're at today, um, you'd be right about $2 to 225 on these guys, is what you could expect. Um, so that pretty much covers most of our basic constitutional currency we have over here. Um, if we uh, want to move on to the next section, I don't know if you want to cut through. Yeah, or... You can. Okay. So we've got uh, got some constitutional stuff, and we have some unusual stuff that's made to look constitutional. So uh, let's talk about this. I'm going to reach my, one of my favorite tools in the shop. Um, this is not a plug for CDN Publishing. This is just literally a tool that we use a lot of. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, this is the hard copy of the gray sheet. Uh, it's also available regularly. Um, this is the January 2020. Uh, addition. Um, we uh, use these uh, every day um, to price coins when they come in the door. So when we pop these open, uh, there's some great uh, 
uh, great information that can be gleaned in here through the ads and the, the uh, uh, informational sections, but more importantly are the coin values that are listed in here. Um, this is an invaluable tool for any collector, whether you're new or old. The gray sheet is a really reliable way to know what dealers are working with when we're buying, selling, and trading inside the industry. Um, this is kind of the standard to establish a value so that we're all pretty close to the same page. Of course, regional availability. You know, let's say, for example, you're in, in Buffalo, New York, and there's 8,000 of a certain coin that people in California or the Midwest uh, can't get. They might pay more in California or the Midwest than they would in Buffalo, New York. Uh, here in Indiana, um, we tend to see a lot of uh, the uh, collectible uh, proof uh, silver rounds come in. Um, and what happens is that the market's heavily flooded with those. So when we establish value, we know that where we're marketing them is going to also establish how much we're going to, or influence how much we're going to pay for the items. So we typically use gray sheet um, to determine value. So what we're going to do is uh, pop this puppy open and we're going to go to the um, modern commemoratives, which uh, according to this guide is on page 29. So we flip forward here, and this is just literally, um, they're broken down by uh, denomination, uh, and then MS or PR, this is important, so you have $1 MS, that's the mint state versions, or $1 PR for the proof versions. Uh, this is uh, very important because the, the, the values can be pretty different. Uh, right now, most of the modern commemorative stuff is not um, super highly prized, but there are a few editions that are, so you want to make sure you take a close eye. So let's pick a very common example. Um, if we take a look here, we have the 1986. Um, we have the Ellis Island piece. This is, of course, the $1. I'm going to pop this out so people can see. Um, and this holder is actually damaged, so that would make a difference because the values in here are assuming that everything is pristine as it was shipped from the mint. This particular piece is not. Um, it's been damaged. Not only has it obviously been opened, you can see this is actually loose and opened, but pieces of the plastic are missing from the capsule. You can also see there's that indicative uh, toning that's occurring. Now, that toning is a good sign that the coin actually probably hasn't been handled. What's more likely is that this has gotten dropped and it's popped open a little bit and somebody's pressed it closed. But uh, like me, they, they pulled it out to take a look at it. So we take a look and you've got uh, the iconic uh, uh, Liberty uh, torch in the background there. It's got some great art to it. This is, of course, the 1986S. So we're going to take a look here for the 1986S $1 coin. Uh, we find it right here, Statue of Liberty, 1986 right now, uh, and the proof, which is what this one is, uh, is $17.50 is its value for that piece. Now, the value is what it would be for dealer to dealer to purchase this coin, okay, or if you as a collector walked up to a dealer and wanted to purchase this coin, okay? Now, the price we would pay, obviously, will be somewhat below that, and every dealer uses their own system to determine value and how much they would pay. Um, again, I talked about regional, reg, regional uh, proliferation or availability. The more and more something's available, the lower and lower the value or the influence it has on it. Let's not forget, this is silver coinage. This puppy still contains, you know, uh, silver. And it is still, no matter what you do to it, always going to contain silver value. And today it's silver at $18.04 per ounce. Well, my goodness, the coin is worth more as an ounce of silver than the book gives it value. So you have to take that into account when you're looking at these values. If this coin says that it's 1750, you know, that's because the day this book was printed, silver might have only been at $17.70 or with this being a 90% coin, uh, it would be less value. So with that being said, you have to also understand your coinage and know what you're buying. Most of these were shipped with a certificate. Let's see if this one is in here. And it is. And remember I said we want to be careful because some of these are not 100%, they're 90%, which is the case in this one. It actually is 900% fine or 90% silver. It contains 0.86 of a troy ounce. So if we get that calculator out again, <laughs> you would take uh, the $18.04, and uh, I'll actually do this right in front of you on camera here so everybody can see. So $18.04, and then you'd multiply that times the... Uh, 0.77 of an ounce that it contains, and it's got $13.89 worth of metal in it. $13.89 worth of metal. So we would melt it down for $18.39. Um, I'm sorry, $13.89. I said that backwards. With that being said, that's if you're going to melt the coin down, which, of course, you would never want to do that to a coin when there's nothing wrong with the coin because it's going to do nothing but appreciate over time. Again, common issue. Heavily available. Everybody's got one. A lot, these guys were sold in several programs. Uh, we've got a really great example here. This one was sold by itself like this with a single coin with a holder. 
in the beautiful velvet box. Um, the box is here with its certificates. You've got both certificates that came with it. One discussing the coinage uh, and the details and one talking about the history of the coins, okay? Um, it has the box and everything there for it. It doesn't have the outer sleeve. These were originally issued with an outer sleeve. Um, but with that being said, then there is the companion piece, which was sold separately as well, which is, of course, the half dollar. Um, again, similar packaging. You can see it's designed to, com to complement it. Um, and actually, this one, somebody has taken the item out. The reason we know this is because it's actually in the holder upside down. It actually should be this direction so that they look the same. Um, now you can see where they both have the little tab at the bottom. You peel up to make it pop out. But that's how it should look, and they should line up like that. Kind of fun. Um, other interesting thing about this guy, if you take a look, um, he's actually a clad piece. This is actually the clad version. So a um, little interesting history there. And then the third way that they issued or marketed this particular set was like this, where they had the two pieces together in the same size container, same size outer sleeve, same size uh, cardboard tray. However, the inner plastic or uh, velvet box was shaped differently. So this velvet box was larger. It contained both versions of the coin. And if we pop this up, we'll find that we do have our certificates, okay? And then you have the, um, the silver coinage, which is weighted on the silver dollar piece. And we pop this open, and we have the half dollar piece, which you'll note contains no silver. It is clad, so it's 33% or 30.33 of a troy ounce of copper and 0.03 uh, troy ounce of nickel. So, uh, again, there's no silver fineness to it. Um, these are both the proof examples again. Now, this is where knowing what's in your book is going to make a big difference because now we're going to look at the book. Um, and we take a look down here again. And if we want to pan in. Now, instead of looking at the proof set, we're actually going to come over here and look at coin sets, okay? And we look here, we have the Statue of Liberty, 1986, Statue of Liberty two-piece set, and the book value on that is only $20 for the completed set. So these are right at 20 bucks a piece in value. So, of course, as a buyer, you'd want uh, to buy it for a little bit less than that. Um, keep in mind, it, it still contains all that silver and has a tremendous amount of um, numismatic uh, beauty to it. So when you're making an offer to someone to purchase these, you have to take that into account. But it's kind of interesting to see how you got the, the one piece of 1750, the clad piece, the book value. Um, I don't think we looked at that one yet. But let's go ahead and look down here. The Statue of Liberty is $2.85 um, for that particular one. That is for the 1986S uh, half dollar. In clad. Remember, there's no silver in that one, so it's only worth $2.85, but it's still a pretty piece. The reason these are so low value, there were lots and lots of them made, there were a tremendous amount of them sold, and there are lots of them available, and it doesn't contain silver value, and it's not very old yet. I mean, it's only 1986, and this is 2020, so as the coin gets older, you'll see that value start to skyrocket. If you take a look at things that are prior to 1957, they're starting to go crazy now. But the value is skyrocketing exponentially uh, as the dates get older and older. Uh, you look at the 51 and 52 mint and proof sets. Those guys go from being, um, if you go, I think it's a 54 set today, uh, was worth like $21 and a 52 set and 53 sets are worth over $50 a piece. Um, the exact numbers I'd have to look, but gives you an idea right there. They've crossed that line. So as these guys get closer, as the 86s get closer, you'll start to see them jump up also. They're a great candidate to hang on to your collection because you're not going to get rich taking them to a local coin guy. You're not going to get anybody at an auction to pay you an insane amount of money, and you're not going to take them to a local coin club and trade them because everybody there should be educated enough to look up roughly what the value is. And even in the Red Book, if we grabbed a copy of the Red Book and took a look at it, let's take a look. This is, of course, the U.S. Red Book. So we look in the commemoratives. Uh, we need modern, modern commemoratives. I apologize. I don't use the Red Book a great deal except for as a resource novel, so the orders that these are in in the book are a little bit out of my purview here. We go commemoratives. So, trying to find the 86s, guys. I apologize. I've got to flip a little faster. I should have had these earmarked before we started videoing. Okay. We're getting closer here. I'm off by a page. Here we go. So we look at the 86s, the red book value. Remember we said the gray sheet tells us that the, uh, the, the clad half dollar was $2.85. A graded MS67 would be worth $5 according to the gray sheet. The same type mint proof set is $5. So the MS and the graded are exactly the same value, um, both MS or proof, 5 bucks. So the gray sheet says $2.85. Kind of gives you a good indication this is intended for insurance and replacement values. 
uh, to give you an idea of what you might expect, expect to spend if you were forced to go and replace the coin and you had to get it right away and you're not going to be able to do any kind of value or bargain shopping. Okay. Same thing with the, the uh, silver dollar. Uh, the book value said seventeen fifty, and this guy is a twenty-five dollars in the book. So it gives you kind of a good idea there uh, of how to compare what you can actually get, expect to get out of your coins versus what the coin books say the value is. So um, we look at some other coins we've got on the table here. Um, we've got some mint and proof sets. Um, these guys are all low dollar. Um, we take a look. Those don't even go together. Right. You notice that. Yep. Yep. Well, if you notice, this is the 1980. And this was a 1979, so somebody's got two partial or half sets. Um, typically, these were shipped like this. Um, there would have been a, another piece in here, which is a piece of cardboard separating them. They were shipped with a piece of cardboard separating them. This one has the mint token with it. If we flip these over, you can see you've got the Philadelphia uh, and the Denver mints. Um, that's why these are both circulation edition, Philadelphia and Denver, uncirculated sets from 1972. Um, no silver. No silver value whatsoever. Uh, book value, again, not real high. We can take a look what these are at. They'll be under the mint sets instead of the, these are not commemorative. Those are mint sets. So we look in here under uh, mint sets, and I apologize again. Should have earmarked this before we started. Uh, mint and proof sets. There we go, page 27. So we flip forward to page 27 and take a look. And we're going to find the 1972 set. I'm actually going to use the set so to line across the paper because my eyes sometimes go a little wonky if I don't use something to line it out. So we find the 1972 mint set. 58, 59, 60, 61, 70, 72 mint set. So the book value is only $2.75 on this set, which is not very much above its uh, actual face value. So, right. Yeah, again, not a high dollar. In this particular area, most of the dealers are paying around 65 to 70 percent, which would actually be below the face value of the coins. So we don't do that. Um, we guarantee you will at least pay you face value on your mint and proof sets. <laughs> and uh, in, in some cases, the best I can do for you is give you the bid, uh, All right. the bid price or the you know the, the dealer ask price. So if I give you the full 275, um, I'm very competitive compared to what other uh, coin shops are. But we don't always do that. It just depends on what you've got in the condition. You know, this one the M, the envelope is actually damaged. Um, You've got, you know, all kinds of surface issues. You're missing the insert card, which, of course, isn't a big deal. It's not much more than the 3 by 5 note card, but it isn't, it isn't in mint state. It isn't sealed. So in this case, we would look at it, and we'd probably look at the face value and then give you an extra 5 or 10 cents, maybe a quarter, just to, you know, give you something for hanging on to it. Unfortunately, it's, it's one of those items, again, you should probably hang on to it unless you have to sell it. Um, you get into the proof sets. So you'll notice that we were talking about a mint set before. This is a proof set. They were packaged differently during this time frame. Um, this is a 1989 set. We see this, uh, the card and certificate are here. The coins, these coins are encapsulated. You can see those are on the proof planchets with the proof dies. Uh, a lot of people don't know that, but to uh, give you an idea, these guys are struck twice. Uh, each coin has been hit twice by the die, um, and they're on the specially prepared planchets, and the dies are polished after uh, a much shorter run of coins than the business strike coin. So it gives you a much better beautiful version of the coin. Um, again, has not reached a high value yet, so let's take a look. So instead of looking at mint sets, we're going to look at the proof sets again. And this is the 1989. So we pop right on up here to 89. I should say up here, I was going down. So the 89 traditional set is only $3.25 is the bid price on this one. Yeah, so it's not super high. Again, give it some time, it'll grow. So that kind of gives you an idea on those guys. Um, there is a, another proof set here. This one is from Bicentennial Set. Again, not super, super high in, in value. It, beautiful coin. Great example. This one has a fun holder, which is designed to actually be a stand as well. It doubles as a protective case for the um, obverse of the coin while still allowing the reverse to be exposed. Um, you got the bicentennial effigies on the back. You got the, the Liberty Bell and the moon. And, of course, uh, Mr. Revere there showing you the, uh, showing you the uh, drummer sequence, uh, however you want to look at it. Uh, neat piece uh, of history. It's a great coin, great collector, or great coin set, great collectability. Not high value, so let's take a look. Um, again, with this being the 76 three piece set, we're going to look at the proof sets. And we go to 76S, and it's a whopping five bucks, guys. Wow. Beautiful coins, just not there numismatically yet. So right. Give them some time and they'll get there, okay? Um, here we have um, a Helvetica set. Um, these Helvetica sets are kind of cool. They're, um, there are some silver coins in here and some non-silver coins in here. Um, we'll have to get the World Coin Guide out to take a look at these guys. And unfortunately, we can't see the dates on all of them. We're assuming 
um, that they're not the same date because we have a 69, a 70, and a 68. So we're going to assume these are from different dates, which means we have to look up which ones contain silver, which ones don't. I will tell you that I've bought several of these Helvetica sets recently. We typically value them at right about six bucks. Um, they're not high value. These were made of lower content silver than U.S. currency, so they're not like 90 percenters. Um, and there's not a blanket number. They're not all of them are you know, 0.70, 0.68, 0.35. Swiss? Is um, it Swiss? Uh, the Helveticas are, yeah. Yep. Um, I got it right. Yep, that's correct. Um, they were very popular because of the cross pattern that was on them, and a lot of people thought that they were like uh, uh, part of the Red Cross or the Protective Cross or something like that, but that's not the case at all. Um, it was a cross and shield, which was part of their emblems for their government. Uh, you know, so much like the, you, you get the, uh, the, the flag of Texas has the great star in the center. Everybody sees that. They know it's the state of Texas. Well, if you're looking at Numismatica and you see this, you know that that's, from, that's a Helvetica. So... Yep, kind of fun. Well, you're getting um, through it, aren't you? And the yeah. only other thing, what would you say, I mean... Let's get to these guys. So these are kind of fun. Um, they're meant to look like a U.S. Mint product. Not really intended to fool anybody, but they are intended to look like that. These are um, commemorative Persian Gulf tokens. And I'm going to actually pop this the card out. The other ones come out a lot easier. Okay, well, I, I got this one. We're good. Right. Yeah. These are Persian Gulf tokens, okay? Um, they have the... Persian Gulf Battles at the bottom, February 27th, 1991. You have, of course, Air Force, Infantry, and I don't remember, but I think this, one, I think this one's actually Marine Corps with the helicopter, but I could be wrong which ones are which. Um, we look at the back. We've got the uh, eagle pattern with the, star, with the flag behind it. Um, again, this is not U.S. issued coinage, but um, I'm going to use the other. I'm not going to pop this one. I'm going to grab one of the other ones and pop it out because it's already been out of its holder. Um, but uh, these guys, unfortunately, uh, to break everybody's hearts, uh, maybe, do you, do you want to tell them, Silver Steeler, or shall I? Uh, well, I told them on my live stream just last night. If they had watched that, they know. But they're, they don't have any silver in it. They're just coppers, right? I mean, yeah, these are, I these are, they're clad. Um, they're clad, so they, they obviously contain white metal additives. But they are not 925 or 999 or 850 or 450. They are, they are just nice collectible pieces. Um, there was an issue of these that was made that did contain silver. The ones that did, if you look on the side, had a place where the reading had a gap in it and it had the number .999 fine on huh. it. So if you ever find one of these in a flea market or a trade show, look at your rim. It's the only way to designate the difference between the silver and the non-silver versions. Gotcha. Um, so interesting fun fact. They are still a really cool piece. Yeah. Um, we actually still pay $6 for these, for the set. $6 um, for the set. Yeah, we pay $6 for the set. They typically sell for about $10, $12. Um, they were originally issued with a mint price, I believe, of nineteen ninety nine per coin if you bought them in separate sections. Wow. Like this, where the U.S. Mint sent them one at a time. They would send mm. it to you in a little little bag, a little velvet bag. And then if you bought the three-piece set, I believe it was issued at forty nine ninety five for gotcha. the three-piece set. So it is pretty pricey, kind of expensive. But they, they mimicked, if you look, oh, yeah. they were made to look a lot like the mm -hmm. U.S. Mint packaging. Mm -hmm. um, if you flip the mint packaging over and you look at the back, there's really it's really easy to see why, especially on a TV ad or an internet ad, why it might confuse some people. Sure. This is a great example of where someone has said, "Hey, I can capitalize on people's collectability and desire to buy something," um, but uh, gives you a rough idea that well, not idea, but uh, gives you a rough feeling that maybe somebody's out to get somebody. They're not. They're not telling because they didn't mark it as silver or silver clad or silver plated. And we see a lot of that kind of stuff that comes in. So it says silver clad, silver plated, silver layered. Uh, or silver tone that doesn't actually contain silver. These guys weren't intended to, to fool anybody. They are a commemorative token, um, but don't mistake them for a U.S. Mint product. They just kind of have copied the very successful packaging of the U.S. Mint, so kind of cool. We've got a couple of uh, coin sleeves here. We're going to break some hearts with this one, guys. U.S. Nickel set. This is a late-date set. does not contain any silver. We would pay face value plus $1 for this set, okay? Now, unfortunately, somebody's got a $42 price tag on there. I'm hoping what they did was they went through and valued these all at the highest possible value <laughs> according to gray sheet or, or red book right. and then put that number on there. Um, the reality is if you walked into my store, you would expect to buy it at face value plus two bucks. We don't make a lot of money on them. And at most shops you go to, these guys, we get lots and lots and lots and lots of them, stacks and stacks of them. They're not high dollar yet. And nickels are a difficult sell anyway. So we get into Buffalo Nickels. You got a book here. It's got a few in it. We would price these individually, probably in the neighborhood of between um, five and fifteen cents a piece. 
the no date ones that are heavily damaged they're they're you know obviously their face value would give you know their value is probably five or six cents um maybe as much as 10 at an auction but by the time you take out commissions and then if you look at these guys some of them you could probably get into the 10 or 11 cent range but if you look quite a few of them have got heavy surface damage on them so they're not highly valuable um and again if you look this set is pretty much empty yeah so we would just take and multiply the coins and then since some of them are five dollars five cents and some of them might be as much as a quarter we take and probably multiply them by 10 cents is what i would do for a normal person walking in the door um to give them just a kind of a flat value across the board if they want me to go through each individual coin and do that i will but they run the risk actually of they may come out a, a little bit ahead or they may come out a little bit behind i do the average thing and it just saves everybody time and trouble especially since you're not talking about a lot of money again same thing here very common book set these guys are really difficult because, again, they're late date and they're only partially um, um, grade worthy or not even grade worthy, partially uh, uh, save worthy coins. Uh, they're also not all wheat cents. Um, as you'll notice, this set uh, it goes up to 59 and starts, so, you, so you've got some that are not. Literally, these guys have all got condition issues, so we would pay face value on those, and then we would across the board pay two cents a piece for those and pay six cents a piece on the Steelies. So if you go through and do the math on those, you can see you're going to get rich and retired to Maui. All right. If you look at this book again, um, no key dates, but it is a book number one. So you have some earlier dates. You just needed to look at the first page to say no key dates. That's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. No 1909s. Nope. None of the 1909s. Um, no 14D. Uh, you jump over to the 31S, and we don't see a 31S, you know, which was, again, another low minting but a very popular coin. Um, and, you know, the, the, the 32D has even lower, the 32D being the 10.5 million, and there's not one of those. So you're just not going to have any real big value here. All right. Um, the ones from here over, we'd pay five cents a piece for, and these guys would be in the neighborhood of about six cents a piece for just their early dates. So we can get a little bit of a premium. We'd sell them for around nine to ten cents. So gives you kind of a, a good feel there for the value of your collection. Um, there is one other piece up here that I didn't mention that was uh, encapsulated. This is an American Red Cross uh, fundraising token, um, and these were from 1881 to 1981. So uh, they're a fundraising token. We pay a dollar a piece for these, and we sell them for two bucks. Um, they sit around for a really long time. That's why there's such a discrepancy in the buy sell price. They're not right. like they're not like heavily circulated items. Um, we have a um, a local piece of history. Yes, yes. Falls Park, Pendleton, in Indiana. We shoot videos there. Yeah, 150th uh, sesquicentennial token. Um, again, these are worth a couple of bucks. They're not high dollar. They're just worth a couple right. dollars. We we pay fifty cents to a dollar piece on those. So now we've got. Um, Chinese luck tokens. I'm going to break everybody's hearts. These aren't coins. Okay. These are Chinese luck tokens. Um, the, they are modeled after the Qing Dynasty coins. Okay. Um, but this, this particular one you can tell is actually not because of the manufacturing is not right. You've got issues with the surface back here being way pitted. So these were actually cast and made as lucky tokens. Um, a lot of times you, you've heard How this, long ago? Um, these are probably from, I'd say, about 1920s, 1930s. Oh, so yeah. the, the little writing on the 300 years old is mm -hmm. not correct. No. Um, actually, I'm going to rephrase that. That one is correct. And that one is correct. This one is not. So, okay. Now, so, yeah, let's talk about these other two then. Okay, so <laughs> let's, let's take a look. Okay. This one is an early one. This one is correct. I want you to take a look at the differences in the coinage. Okay. So we look at the coins. You'll notice how this one is very soft around the edges, very thin, but the details are all still there. That is not, um, I mean, it's, it's obviously where These were copper bronze mix. But I want you to take a look at something else. Okay, these guys are very thin and narrow. Okay, now we compare this to this one, and you can see a slight difference in thickness. Okay, you can feel the coins. Okay, and not just me, but I'm going to have somebody else. Let's get another set of hands over here. Okay, I don't know how sensitive your hands are. Oh, that one's heavier. Yes, this one's made out of, out of pot metal or heavier metals. This one is the actual correct one. Okay, so these two here are real. This one is not. You can feel the difference. You can feel the yeah. thickness difference. Uh huh. You can't see it as well, but you can see it. Uh huh. But just feeling it. Yeah. So you've got these guys are the real deal. That's why I said I was going to break some hearts here. Okay. Not all of them, but break some hearts. So this guy's just a Chinese luck token. We pay five cents a piece for those. These guys, um, they're really cool. They're really old. They're great art. They're still only worth about a buck for the pair. So these are kind of like um, Roman century tokens or uh, 
some of the early tokens that were carried for trade within military or for purchasing items and transit goods in that there are lots and lots and lots of them and in many cases they were buried or interred in the ground. Uh, sometimes it was done as a safety precaution, you know, they didn't have banks back then. Uh, sometimes it was done as an offering to the gods. Uh, and sometimes it was also done as a memorial with the people who were interred if they were buried at the time, you know. Um, when they earth things like the Terracotta Warriors or they unearth uh, uh, famous uh, dig sites around uh, you know, the Great Wall of China, they're always finding huge caches of these tokens and coins. So unfortunately it means that there's lots and lots and lots of examples of them that are readily available in really high grade condition um, in the areas of the desert out there they typically didn't get a lot of corrosion because there wasn't much moisture and if they were buried inside pots or containers uh, they were kind of protected so there's a lot of them in high high uh, grades um, the other set to, uh, key to that is, is the collectability um, there are of course you know more Chinese citizens in the world than there are almost any other continent you know they have what was 1.5 billion people in the Chinese uh, peoples right now um, with that being said, less than 1% of their population collect coins. Um, so there's just not a lot of call for them, a lot of ask for them. Whereas if you take a look at the exact opposite with the Roman currency uh, that you find that are buried the same way, buried in pots for either military purposes like a bank, you know, offerings to the gods or interred with people when they died or in the case of some cases like around Pompeii where they were buried by uh, pyroclastic ash. Um, you do find large numbers of those coins that are in really great shape and if you find some of them, if you've got the right version, like let's say you find an owl in really great condition, you got a three, four, five hundred dollar coin. Those contain silver also, interestingly enough. Then you get into some of the bronze Roman coinage and they're a couple bucks just like these guys. They're really, there's just so many of them and the difference there being is that in there, there are far fewer you know, Italian collectors or Roman collectors or Persian collectors in the world, but those particular coins have cross-population because many of the European and English peoples will collect those coins as well because of the tie-in in the history. Where the Asian peoples, because of the great dynamic difference in our peoples, don't necessarily cross value or collect as much as we do. So when it comes to the collectability of the Chinese and Asian coins, you really have to have something that is really high value, really rare, probably graded and authenticated. Authenticated is more likely, but graded and authenticated to drive that value up. Even though they're 300 years, 400 years, 500 years old, they're still not really super valuable. But they're great pieces to keep, and they, they were also carried around, the ones with the holes in them. Um, a lot of them would actually string them on things and carry them around for good luck. Um, the hole in the center was designed to allow them to carry them around and pass them out as coinage. But you'll find a lot of times people use these to make things out of. Um, I actually saw one recently at an auction that was made into a doll where they had strung them together using rattan and made arms and legs and a head and all of that out of these for good luck and they'd hang it in their home. Um, the symbol, the symbology, and I, I don't, uh, I, I can't read the symbology on these guys, but each of these symbols has a different meaning and they're usually calling to either a specific god or calling to a specific deity or maybe to the elements and asking for help and they're, they're, they were to in, inspire good luck in carrying them around. Um, you've heard the old token throw a penny in the wishing well. That's that's a Western practice. Well, they would carry these around in their pocket for good luck. Same principle, you know, it's a good luck token. Um, so, yeah, kind of fun. A little history there for you. Um, we've covered quite a few things there. Why don't, we, uh, idea. why don't we just come back here in a second? All right, we're back with some totals. Go ahead. All and right, so we went through and added up everything individually, and uh, it works out that this entire group is worth, uh, we would offer $317 for this group of coins that were sitting here on the counter. Uh, so if, you, you know, if you're keeping a tally what we're at, basically, uh, we broke that down into each group individually. We're gonna be passing this along. Um, but that's what we ended up with, was a, a grand total of uh, $317 for the entire collection. Um, you know, the, the thing to remember when you're looking at collections and, and determining the value is not just what the book says, but also what can you really get when you go to sell it, how available is it, the condition of the coins, and, you know, again, the last thing to remember is that, uh, you, you, how badly you need the money. You know, do you, is, it, is it more valuable for you to have cash in your pocket, walking around the street, finding something else you could use the money for, paying a bill, investing in something better? you know, uh, upgrading your collection, uh, or is it better to hang on to the items that don't bring you any joy or love anymore? Remember that the right. hobby of numismatics is first and primarily about the joy and love of collecting coins and or currency. 
And when you balance that against the financial possibility of enhancing your net worth by adding to your collection or preserving a piece of history for future generations, you have to make those decisions on a case-by-case -case basis because let's say, for example, you've got a hundred of the same coin and nobody you know wants one. You don't need them. They're taking a broom in your, spa in your safe and on top of that, you might want to buy a, another piece of a collection somewhere else you need the cash. It's better for you to sell them off to someone. Whatever you decide to do, please remember, take them to a professional. Take it to your LGS. Of course, I'd love for you to come and see me, but if not, always contact Silver Steeler. He'd love to take them to look at your items too, especially Silver. I mean, I'm just telling you guys, yeah. he loves Silver. That's all yeah. I want out of this collection. Also, remember, right. if you have too much Silver and you just got to get rid of it, you can throw it in an envelope and mail it to us. We'll gladly take it. I'll even pay for shipping. Right. Uh, also, if you have a collection and you want to get it looked at, and I'm going to give a shameless plug here. If you want to get it looked at and you don't have time to take it somewhere, where you can always ship it to someone like me. Contact us ahead of time. Let me know that you're thinking about shipping something. Ship it with tracking. That way you know we got it in our hands and we'll take a look at it for you. We don't charge anything to evaluate a collection. Just like this, we do it every day for customers that come in the door. We take a look at the collection. We'll give you a valuation. We explain to you how we arrive at the valuation of the coins. And then if you ask us to, we'll make you an offer to purchase them. We want all of our customers that come in here to realize that whether they're just getting information because they're now into coin collecting, or whether they're trying to liquidate their collection for some reason, or whether they're just exchanging, they want to trade in stuff they don't want anymore and buy stuff they do, make sure that whoever you do it with, they explain how they came to the values because there shouldn't be secrets in numismatics. It's not a hidden industry. It shouldn't be, you should never be afraid to go to your local coin shop guy or your, your, your collector's club and discuss the value of coins. It isn't a secret, and I know a lot of people are afraid to do that, but don't. Also, be aware that you know, many times, just because you've done a little research on the internet, and you see somebody sold a 1956 wheat penny for $1,000, doesn't mean that the one you have in your hands is actually $1,000. There may have been a perfect storm of stuff that happened to cause that coin to sell really high. There's also the fluke factor. There's always a chance that some dude just hit the wrong button and accidentally put the comma in the wrong place, and another guy who had too much money or was half asleep in the middle of the night at his bachelor party clicked buy it now. So when you're doing research on the internet, use reputable sources, use companies that you can uh, refer to as, as having a good history, you know, CDN Publishing, uh, of course, uh, everybody knows the, the, the Whitman Publishing Company, um, Coin, uh, uh, Coin World, um, any of those companies that manufacture periodicals um, will give you an idea to start from and then come to a real value based on, you know, what are your circumstances? Do you need to sell it? Do you not need to? As you heard me say earlier in the video, there are a lot of times when it's better to hang on to the coin than to sell it. Mm -hmm. Of course, as, as a dealer, I will buy almost any numismatics or coinage that come through my door so long as it's the real thing. I will almost always make you an offer if you ask me to. But my determining the valuation should not ever be driven solely on the idea of me buying your collection. It should be informative first, and then if I can purchase the items and make a profit from you, then that should come second. Um, any good coin dealer should treat you the same way. And I would hope that those of you out there that are just getting into the hobby, don't get afraid, don't, are not afraid to go and local, talk to your local coin shop. It's okay. We all started as novices at one point in time. You know, um, you don't gain knowledge if you don't ask questions. You don't learn if you don't try. And if you keep your head in the sand, you're never going to get any better than you were. And by all means, whether you're looking to sell your collection or not, it's fun for me to look at your collection. I get joy out of it. I know that that you know, winning image and, and uh, Silver Steeler love to look at coins from everybody else. That's why we do what we do. So share your coinage. Whether you want to sell it or not, share it with the world, be it through a video, a direct message, or walking into an LGS. Share that collection, and maybe, who knows, you might just unearth something that's worth a ton of money. You might be like the, the collection that came in today, and a lot of common and average stuff. There's still value in all of it. So, you know, chin up, have lots of fun, and, and go out there and find the bargains, guys. And remember, look at every auction, every garage sale, every flea market, and don't ever throw a box away from the attic without opening it up. Because <laughs> in the bottom of it, you might find a roll of silver eagles, or you might find a Confederate gold piece. You never know. Okay. So, can you give us information for our subscribers to contact you if they want? Well, sure, absolutely. You can contact me. Uh, we're located here at the shop in Anderson. Uh, if you want to call 765-356-3295, uh, that's direct to me. Uh, you can also contact us on the internet if you want to go through Facebook, uh, Dragon's Horde Coins and Gaming, uh, or you can directly email us, uh, Dragon's Horde Coins Gaming and Jewelry, I'm sorry, Dragon's Horde Coins and Jewelry uh, at yahoo.com. 
Um, and of course, uh, you're always welcome to stop by. We're located at 2210 South Scatterfield Road here in Anderson, Indiana. Uh, you come in and see the shop, sit down, uh, enjoy a soft drink. We'll be glad to talk to you about your collection. Um, you know, again, it doesn't cost anything to enjoy numismatics unless you decide to buy or sell or trade something. So come in and share your knowledge and bring us your collection. We'd love to look at it. Thank you so much, Kurt. Well, it's going to bring this one to a close. Remember to like, subscribe, and all those other good things. We'll see you on the next video.